Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Janet Winston. I'm a professor at Cal Poly Humboldt and co-chair of the PAM Caucus and part of the wonderful collective that has formed the Palestine Arab and Muslim Caucus. I'm a white, queer, cis Jewish woman in her late 50s. I have dark hair. My pronouns are she, her. On behalf of the Palestine Arab and Muslim or PAM Caucus of the CFA Racial and Social Justice Council, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to our panel on Islamophobia, Palestine, and the CSU's checkpoints along the bridge to social justice, healing the wounds. Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Sabah al khair, masa al khair, masa al noor. Buenos dias, buenas tardes, buenas noches for everybody who's joining us. My name is Rabab Abdul Hadi. I'm the co chair of the PAM Caucus. We are a collective, and I have a short hair with glasses, and I'm wearing a Palestinian embroidered dress and earrings of coins from. Palestine, when it existed before 1948. Back to you, Janet. Yes, usually we call on people from the audience to make the land acknowledgement, but in this webinar style, uh, we can't do that. So I just want to say that I'm calling in from Cal Poly Humboldt, which is located on the present and ancestral homeland and unceded territory of the Wiat tribe. We want to acknowledge that we gather as the Palestine Arab and Muslim Caucus of the Racial and Social Justice Council of the California Faculty Association on the traditional land of the indigenous people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it, it through the generations. This calls us to commit to continuing to learn how to better be better stewards of the land we inhabit as well. To recognize the land is an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we reside on and a way of honoring the indigenous people who have been living and working on the land from time immemorial. It is important to understand the long-standing history that has brought us to reside on the land and to seek to understand our place within that history. Land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. Acknowledging the land is an important indigenous protocol that we are honoring here today. I want to add that as an indigenous Palestinian, uh, it's our responsibility towards our siblings on whose lands we are and that remains theirs. We'd want everybody who goes to and or lives in Palestine to recognize the indigenous people of our homeland and not to use their indigeneity or members in black, indigenous, or other people of color, BIPOC communities to act as if we did not matter. With that in mind, this is the way we approach and we reach to our siblings here in Turtle Island I am, come from San Francisco State, which sits on unceded Ohlone territory. And I also am on the East Coast on the Lenape indigenous communities who have also been displaced from their land, just like the Palestinians. I am going to just say a few words about the formation of the PAM caucus and what we're all about. Um, and this was a long time coming and there are so many people that participated and were active in a collective to make this happen. Uh, officially, we spent nearly two years beginning in October of 2019 uh, at the October CFA assembly. And then on August 9th, 2021, so nearly two years ago, we became an official PAM Palestine Arab and Muslim caucus. And so much work went into this, but the goal here is just to spotlight some, it doesn't represent all of our members um, or potential members, but some of the work that people have been doing, not for two years, but for decades. Um, one of the themes that we wanna highlight is the generational struggle and resistance that people have faced and passed down knowledge amongst the, um, their, their teachers and their students and um, activists, siblings. 
And so that's a really beautiful thing that we look at the range um, of activism and scholarship and teaching that's gone on for so many years and so many decades. This is meant to be an interactive session. We have eight speakers who will be speaking for five minutes each. And um, we, we hope that there will be time for conversation amongst the panelists as well as with question and answer from the attendees. This is really a, a labor of love. Um, and we, we present this to you as our official coming out um, as an official caucus with the spirit of collectivity and also to just invite you to get involved, to become a member of the PAM Caucus. Um, if you share our uh, goals and our mission, which I'll be reading in a minute, then you are very welcome to become a member of the caucus. Uh, PAM is a space to learn about, critically discuss, and lead on questions and or issues concerning Arabs, Muslims, and or Palestine within the academy within labor movements, and as part of broader peace and justice movements. We do this while also collaborating on ways to promote racial justice and other forms of social justice work central to the mission of CFA. As members support and collaborate with CSU faculty, students, and staff who are targeted for harassment, censor, or censorship, based on their research teaching or advocacy on justice for Muslims, Arabs, and or around Palestine. It also provides a safe and dedicated space to educate and act in coalition with other Council of Racial and Social Justice caucuses on such issues as the impact of Muslim bans on CSU faculty, staff, and students, violence associated with campus policing, as we heard in the panel before this one, the need for curricular integrity and intellectual expertise in implementing the CSU ethnic studies requirement and other intersectional cross caucus social justice work. As such, the caucus welcomes scholars, educators and advocates who are committed to co-liberation with Arabs, Muslims and Palestinians and who do not exceptionalize colonialism, apartheid, and military oppression in Palestine or elsewhere, but rather see it as part and parcel of the indivisibility of justice in all our daily lives and as members of the CSU system. Rabab, do you have anything you want to add? Just want to say that I want to reach out and hug everybody and just say hello. And, but we don't have time to do that, but this is really, really amazing. Thank you all. Uh, we have a lot of history and we will continue talking about it. So I think without further ado, we should just get into it and uh, hear our amazing participants who have been struggling for such a long time and who will continue to struggle afterwards. I just want to have say one thing is that being actually in a union space, and being part of a collective process is the only way we can actually come together to resist repression and deliver liberation and engage in struggles with all our communities. Thank you, Sibling Rabab. Um, it's wonderful to share this space with you and with everyone who's here tonight. And our first speaker is Dr. Sabrina Ali Mohammed um, from CSU Long Beach. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Sabrina. I'm an associate professor of sociology at Cal State Long Beach. Today, I am wearing a black shirt. I am a cis queer woman with brown skin and long brown hair. And Yezin, I'll turn it over to you. Hi folks, um, my name is Yasin Zaza and I am a lecturer at San Diego State University. I am a light-skinned Lebanese Palestinian person with dark wavy hair, thick framed round glasses, and I'm also wearing a black shirt at the moment. So before we get started, um, we just wanted to thank the organizers of the PAM panel, Janet and Rabab, thank you so much for your work in bringing us all together today. We're also very thankful for the equity organizers who, you know, I know spend so much enormous months planning this ahead of time. And thank you for having our panel and for the staff for also making this happen. And a shout out to Becca at my campus 
Um, she always, always is there. So um, when we get started today, I just wanted to think about a question um, that might guide some of the things that I'll be talking about, which is how does deepening our understanding of the war on terror strengthen our analyses of anti-racism and social justice organizing in our universities? So in order to really answer this question, we have to center the war on terror in our analysis. It allows us to understand how universities are operating at the nexus of international and domestic state violence. Rather than assume the CSU system, for instance, is a static product of the local, in this case, California's policies, politics, and institutional violences, is to deeply miss how colonialism, warfare, oppression and capitalism transcend national and international borders to render certain populations disposable or threatening to the state's interest, often dependent upon their nationality, race, religion, sexuality, and class. The war on terror has also solidified anti-Muslim racism as a normalized phenomenon, operating on local, national, and global scales. So for instance, every time there's a so-called terrorist threat abroad, it results in hate crimes here. Students often skip class when these events happen. And so when we think about the war on terror, it is being waged on two fronts. We have the international waging of this, but we have the domestic face of the war on terror too. And these are interconnected. The uninhibited ramp up and investment in the war on terror has created a huge boom, and not just in profit making, um, from war machinery, but also translation and investment in a privatized homeland security apparatus, unmatched in the use of its surveillance strategies, equipment, and military style training to de be deployed on its domestic populations. So this has funneled huge money into creating new security infrastructures and its shadow industries that manages terrorist threats within the public domain. So for instance, on my campus at CSULB, it meant that now we rely on a $10,000 bomb sniffing dog demonstrating our campus is guarding against terrorist threats, oftentimes reifying then the legitimacy of the war on terror that we must remain ever vigilant against. So internal and external logics of racialization both also intersect <clears throat> to congeal Muslims as this broad category of nationalities, ethnic groups, who are often deemed as radical extremist threats. And they provide the ideological fodder, um, the ideological fodder for the domestic sphere in particular. Um, it also fuels the security industry whose actors make profit and in the international development and procurement of security related technologies and surveillance. So the translation of these death making apparatuses from the war front to the domestic realm involved the massive transfer of public wealth and service for, profession, <clears throat> for processes of social destruction. So this leaves right, the absence of life affirming support. Another key relationship that's imported from the front lines of the war on terror abroad is adopting militarized training low intensity psychological warfare tactics and importing programmatic content from counterintelligence operations. So one such offensive militarized counterintelligence operation program that has become the feature of the domestic front of the war on terror is what is known as countering violent extremism. So I'll move on and, and pass it over to my co-presenter Yezin to talk a little bit more about this program and its role on our university campuses. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, yeah, so I think our intention in, in really thinking about talking about this program called Countering Violent Extremism is this idea that Sabrina was talking about, which to us, the university is a microcosm that contains economic, sociopolitical, and bureaucratic tendencies that, that demonstrate how domestic universities are actually international fronts in the war on terror as well. And so for us, Countering Violent Extremism was a program that was an easy way to kind of think about how does the war on terror play out on a university campus? And so for people who are unfamiliar, um, I don't know if Sabrina, if you wanted me to explain what Countering Violent Extremism was, or if you were gonna go ahead and explain, I'm sorry. Oh, sure, go ahead. Okay, um, so Countering Violent Extremism is, a grant program from the Department of Homeland Security. 
that works specifically to fund universities, nonprofits, local police precincts, uh, mosques, churches, synagogues, et cetera, all under the vein of preventing extremism or preventing terrorism. And so the basic formula is if we put resources into community, we will then be able to prevent and predict terrorism. And so universities specifically were identified as a site of countering violent extremism for three or four different reasons. One of them was the production of academic content. So original research from social scientists, from um, tech uh, researchers who develop algorithms for monitoring social media activity, um, and also, of course, um, militarized, like Department of Homeland Security, majors, minors, et cetera. Um, so the development of research framing violence prevention, um, as well as funding university police and specifically training them how to assess and determine whether or not student populations are likely to be committing terrorism or extremism. Um, you also have the funding of universities to enact localized community programming that is counterterrorism programming that's usually fielded by professors or administrators themselves. So in this sense, the Department of Homeland Security, which was created after 9-11 explicitly in response to the war on terror, is now its own funding apparatus that's given out tens of millions of dollars throughout the United States, a majority of which have been going to universities for the production of rhetoric or programming that furthers racialized understandings of Muslims and more importantly, normalizes the repression of anti-Zionism and anti-racism um, and also the resistance to um, anti-Black racism. And so you have this really, really huge amount of money going into universities to produce this sort of research. Um, and San Diego State University specifically for us is a multi-layered example of the war on terror. And it was this moment where you have the University of San Diego and San Diego State receiving funding um, for enacting countering violent extremist programming at the same time that you have an administrator working at San Diego State University as an informant who was serving as the advisor to the Muslim Student Association and was actually doing informancy work on the students that he was collaborating with at the same time that you have rising investment in the Zionist agenda on the SDSU campus that now which has grown extensively. Um, and so this person who was working as an informant is actually a primary figure who was integral in bringing this program called Countering Violent Extremism to the entire city of San Diego, was marked as someone who worked as an informant in Somali communities um, off campus before being hired on the San Diego State University campus, where he then became someone in charge of diversity um, and equity, and then through that became a student advisor for the Muslim Student Association. And so this example is really niche um, but it's actually a very common way that you see these intricate examples of how um, the sort of liberal tendency of diversity and equity playing an enormous role in the furthering of Zionism, of Islamophobia, of anti-Black racism. You have the repression of student activities because once the students figured out that there was this person who was playing this role, then MSA completely shut down and went MIA for a while before they felt comfortable with returning. Um, and you also have the university itself offering this programming that is stigmatizing anti-repression work. So under CVE frameworks, um, anti-racist organizing is considered an extremist threat. Anti-Zionist organizing is considered an extremist threat. And so these kinds of things for us, um, I think with what Sabrina was opening with, is really emblematic of how the war on terror is an enormous economy that also really streamlines connections abroad and forward. Um, and so I think, for example, um, one of the programs that a university has previously offered is the flying in of and the commissioning of um, um, scholars from around the world who are also doing counterterrorism work in their own regard. 
And for example, the University of San Diego hosted someone who was a Zionist scholar who identified as a liberal Zionist who was for a two state solution, who again came to San Diego and was offering programming looking at the importance of the two state solution as a solution for peace. And so in that sense, it's, it's the University of San Diego, but it's playing host to Zionist scholarship and it's normalizing the existence of Zionism and visiting scholars from Israel is actually a really normalized way that you have um, Zionism and phobic rhetoric being played out um, in the war on terror. Um, and I think that it's a really, really, really condensed example, but just thinking about that moment, you have interactions with students, you have administration, and you also have the production of content by researchers and professors that are normalizing these things all at once. Um, but yeah, I don't know if Sabrina, if there's anything else that you wanted to add. Oh, that was great. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, our next speaker is Stevie Ruiz. Um, well, first, I want to thank uh, Sabrina and Yasan for uh, doing this, uh, your first initial talk. I, I learned a lot just in the 10 minutes, so thank you. Um, and then my name is Stevie Ruiz. I'm a, an associate professor in the Chicana Chicano Studies Department at Cal State Northridge. Um, I'm wearing a polka dot-ish <laughs> blue shirt. Um, I'm 5'10", and I won't tell you my weight because <laughs> the pandemic is... Um, um, but one of the things that I want to kind of say is that um, my introduction to the question of Palestine um, started when I was an undergraduate, and actually, I'm so glad that Manzar is here. Um, Manzar was actually my professor in my sophomore year of undergraduate through my senior year, and just to let you know, to date myself is that that was between the years of 2002 to 2004. But it was an important time with regard to the formation of the Second Intifada. And when she taught this class called um, Comparison, I'm gonna butcher it, but it was uh, comparing modern Latin America and the Middle East, um, and it was a history class. One of the kind of interesting things that she did that kind of awakened my anti-war um, activism was she did a kind of concert of panels where she invited kind of competing debates between um, leftist scholars in, in Palestine and Israel. And then she kind of also cultivated and curated a huge unique debate. And I thought that that was, and I reflect on that a lot now that as a professor, because I don't think that in the moment we are in that that type of courage is even encouraged among the most leftist of ethnic studies departments. And I begin to question myself then is, where have we as ethnic studies scholars, and I'm not just talking about those of us who study race, but those of us who are housed in the left departments, where do we stand with anti-war activism today? And also just in general, where did the left abandon um, its kind of commitment to anti-war peace mo movements? I think that's something that I've kind of been and where did it become pro-military? And I think we kind of see this proliferation in the Obama era where killing becomes easier because you can kill using drone warfare. And then it, became, it becomes even easier during the times of Trump because it's a pullback. But I think one of the most reticent imperial projects that we still don't necessarily connect the dots. And it, what it is so surprising to me is today that a man like George W. Bush is widely celebrated, who was at the time uh, in 2003, literally killing millions of people. And we celebrate this man as a, a peacekeeper. And it was, it was professors like Manzar who were my introduction to ethnic studies. And so I hadn't taken ethnic studies class before, but it was in the history department and she began to get us to think a lot about this question of raciality, racial formation, globality, but thinking about the comparison between the types of coups that were going on in Latin America, which was her field of study, and then how it was housed and became a kind of compatriot 
which became kind of naturalized in kind of US nation development, that war kind of became a consistent measure of this kind of neoliberal project that it saw itself. And so I appreciate what Sabrina and Kassan kind of set up, Yazan had set up because I think it now we see that militarism and war are such a natural part of how we deal with student populations, but it's also such a natural part about how knowledge formation is um, divided across the university. That now in the CSU, it's controversial to take a position on Palestine. It's controversial, but it's not controversial to take a position on Armenia. Um, you know, and that, that's actually what happened on our campus. We took a position about the most recent events that occurred in Armenia. I just say this because I think we're entering into a very political, geopolitical moment in the CSU where academic freedom has not only been constrained, but forces us actually to think in a very particular way about our position as leftist scholars and those of us who are adamant about being Marxist, or ethnic studies scholars, or those of us who study race, I think one of the things that I kind of revisit, and I'm so grateful that we have this um, caucus now called PAM, because it reminds me of the possibilities that Manzar was really courageously fighting, literally on her own on that campus, and God bless you, Manzar. <laughs> but, um, but one of the things that I got out of it was that, and I still, revisit that like what did it mean to be a professor and take such a fringe position at a university that was predominantly white and still is the whitest universe California State University if not the actually what I just actually heard it's the whitest university in the state of California so that beats the UC and the CSU so I'll stop there I just wanted to kind of just say thank you um, and I'm really excited about moving forward with all of you and and keeping the battle up so I'll, I'll defer my time. Thank you so much, Stevie. Our next speaker is uh, one of the PAM officers, Rana Sharif from CSU Northridge. Thank you, Janet. Um, let's see. All right, hi everyone. Um, once again, I'm Rana Sharif. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Gender and Women's Studies at CSUN. I'm Palestinian brown woman. I have brown curly hair. Embracing my face, I have I'm wearing gold earrings and a brown sweater. My pronouns are she, her, he, yeah. Uh, thank you everyone for being here um, this evening and for sharing space with us, particularly on a Friday afternoon. While in the time I have, I will not be able to provide an accurate snapshot of what it means to engage in Palestinian programming. I'll be sharing a recent experience that I had this past fall on my campus at CSUN. In the fall, I was invited to fill in as a moderator for a panel discussion um, at CSUN entitled Palestine History Repeating Itself. In fact, the image you see projected is from the Instagram account of the University Student Union at CSUN for the event. And the event was a collaboration between USU student, uh, USU, excuse me, CSUN and the Student Union at Cal State Dominguez Hill. So one can imagine how exciting it must be to have this opportunity to collaborate across CSUs on the issue of Palestine. Uh, beneath the title, um, Palestine History Repeating Itself, there is an invitation to students, staff, community to, quote, join for an educational discussion and Q&A. This panel promised the centering of Palestinian history as its critical site of inquiry. However, um, how that was achieved, I'm not entirely sure. What the panel did do was not have a single Palestinian to share that history. Therefore, whose history? Who gets to narrate that history? If the intention of the panel was to share the history of Palestinians from the lived experiences of Palestinians, it failed. If the panel's intention was to create programming using the naming of a community as a way to demonstrate its commitment to neoliberal politics, it succeeded. In fact, it felt there was a concerted effort to not represent Palestinian experiences or share our history, to silence our history, to effectively remove us while using us. We became words for an Instagram post and a catchphrase for social media. The question then becomes, how can one talk about Palestine and Palestinians without Palestinians present? As I was stepping in to support the previous moderator, um, I was not the initial um, uh, person asked to moderate for this panel. 
I was stepping in to support the previous moderator who um, themselves is not Palestinian. I met with the primary organizer at CSUN of the event and raised what I thought was a reasonable question. How do you plan on having a, pa a panel on Palestine without a single Palestinian on the panel? Not myself included, of course. And my question was definitely not an indictment on the chosen panelists. They are in their respective ways, all allies of the Palestinian struggle, but none of them are Palestinian. And this was a question I raised to the panelists who all spoke of the erasure and invisibility of Palestinians in academia, cultural sites of production and the media. This particular panel was a primary case in point. While I was added to moderate um, the panel and happened to be Palestinian myself, myself, excuse me, the organizer was, was uh, revealed, um, excuse me, I'm stumbling on my words because I'm trying to read and look at Zoom at the same time, so my apologies. While I was added to moderate and happened to be, I'm Palestinian myself, the organizer was uh, relieved that I was present, but I was not the initial choice, nor was I ever made aware of the panel. And I reminded her that my participation was not organic to the process. And I, in fact, felt tokenized by this liberal academic space. Had the event went as planned without me, not a single Palestinian voice would have participated in the event. The response I re received from the organizer revealed two things, fear and erasure as violence. The organizer who is Muslim um, presenting and a person of color shared with me the fear they had in over-representing Palestinian voices, that somehow in the presentation of Palestinian voices, we come charged, angry, trying to take up too much space. There had been indirect comments made to them to lessen the intensity of Palestinian voices. The organizer felt isolated in the process of planning the event as they, were new, they are new to the campus and were unable to build the network of solidarity and support necessary to perform this work. In our conversation, they expe expressed fear that they had learned um, that the event would be canceled by administration should it center unapologetically Palestinian life. The fear expressed by the organizer, which ultimately lends itself to the elision and erasure of Palestinian voices on campus in programming, reflects the institution's commitment to settler colonial violence. Erasure is central to the logics of, of the settler colonial nation. Lest we forget, we are all here on borrowed land, on stolen land. A panel that uses the naming of our people but does nothing to elevate the exp their experiences, their geographies, our histories of those named is a violence and a harm in and of itself. And with that, I see my time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rana, for those important words. Um, our next speaker is Teresa Montano from CSU Northridge. Unmute myself, and I'm Teresa Montano. I'm a professor of Chicano and Chicano studies at Cal State Northridge. I am um, a Chicana uh, in my late 60s with long on black hair and um, I'm wearing a silver necklace and silver earrings this evening and I see that my video is not on so I'll slow down just a bit so that we can switch the video um, my my presentation is much more of a case study that isn't situated within the CSU but that speaks to the importance of um, peace and justice um, in the broader community, right? And in particular, for those of us in um, ethnic studies, the importance of recognizing a, a number of things. One is our connection to and responsiveness to community, um, our commitment to solidarity, and our commitment to um, centering the experiences the exper experiential knowledge, the intellectual knowledge, and the history of people of color in this in this country um, and in the world. I mean, um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about how the state censor censorship um, of ethnic studies from K through university, right? So from PK through university, beginning with the experiences 
that some of us, there were four of us within um, the uh, institutions of higher education who were invited to come in to write the state's model curriculum for ethnic studies, which was um, a precursor to the adoption of AB 101. And so I want to talk a little bit about the censorship that we've experienced um, in doing that. And basically the bullying that continues as we move towards the implementation of ethnic studies. And I'm often reminded that ethnic studies um, was about uh, opening, um, making sure that the experiences of people of color and native people in this country were no longer excluded from our curriculum, um, but it was also about self-determination. It was also about representation. And we called ourselves a third world liberation front for a reason, right? So that while we were recognizing the fight against racism in this country, we were also inextricably linked to um, international solidarity or movements of solidarity, recognizing that our history in this country was connected to a larger diaspora, whether that be um, solidarity with movements in Africa or in Latin America or in Palestine. All of that was a part of bringing together ethnic studies. And for me, prior to the work within the ethnic studies model curriculum, was a political ideological stance that I took. Um, but now it's becoming uh, much more of a, a movement of solidarity, uh, a multiracial movement for solidarity with um, making sure that there is no erasure as we begin to move ethnic studies. And I want to talk a little bit about two ways that we're seeing that. One is the blatant erasure of anything related to Palestine from the ethnic studies model curriculum. When the committee met to develop the ethnic studies model curriculum, there were um, two lessons that the state um, and the Zionists felt needed to be removed from the model curriculum. One was a lesson on social movements that was not included in the Arab American section. So we actually, without dissent, without debate, by those who are writing the curriculum, included an Arab American studies section within the model curriculum. In that section were um, similar pieces that were in every other chapter, such as everyone picking historical events, and, incident, and incidents that were particular to that particular discipline. So it was the black faculty who talked about what was in the black chapter. It was the Chicano Latino faculty that chose what was going to be in the Chicano Latino chapter, et cetera, et cetera. So each of us also were allowed to select folks that we felt needed to be highlighted in a K-12 school. In the Arab American section, there were the congressional representatives and there was Edward Said. There was also a section on social movements, which was not in the Arab American section, but was in a separate space all of its own that listed a number of social movements, UFW, um, the Asian American um, movement, the um, Dakota Pipeline, uh, and it also listed BDS. It was passed after um, much discussion and debate and became part of the model curriculum. Soon after, it was eliminated. The dissent does not end there. The bullying does not end there. Now as we move towards the implementation of ethnic studies in our school districts, we are also um, bullied and I'll give you one example that, um, that I can think of right now. In Castro Valley, we were asked to apply for a, um, a grant uh, for the implementation of ethnic studies within Castro Valley Unified School District. And we applied as liberated ethnic studies model curriculum. 
What is significant about Liberated Ethnic Studies model curriculum is that it's composed by those original writers of the Ethnic Studies model curriculum who have since removed their names from that curriculum um, and who did take a stand that we would not allow the erasure of anybody from the curriculum. We would not allow the erasure of Palestine from the curriculum. We got the grant and immediately afterwards, organizations like the ADL, the JCRC took a full page ad in the Castro Valley newspaper, um, accusing Liberated of Eth Ethnic Studies of being anti-Semitic and accuse the school board and the superintendent of the same thing. And I don't wanna belabor the bullying and the, the, um, the harm, the violence that that causes those of us who are implementing ethnic studies. What I'd like to end on is the second part of this session, and that's how we heal the wounds. What I have also been able to see as we move ethnic studies into um, K-12 schools are the hundreds of multiracial activists who have allied to make sure that ethnic studies has fidelity to the discipline. Um, Jewish allies like those in the um, Jewish Voices for Peace, Jewish scholars, Jewish activists, Palestinian scholars, Chicano activists, Chicano teachers who have taken a stance that no, we are not going to allow the state to censor ethnic studies or to deny the representation of Arab American children in the curriculum. So while there has been um, uh, some pushback, there's also um, hope in, in the coalition that was built to make sure that we are able to implement ethnic studies in a holistic, complete fashion, that we don't forget um, solidarity and unity, that we don't forget the struggle against imperialism, that we don't forget the anti-racist nature of ethnic studies, that we don't forget the revolutionary character of what ethnic studies um, means as well, and that we recognize that you're never too young to learn it. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, I know there's so much to say. Uh, our next speaker is Mantar Baruha from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Manza Furuha from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. I'm a retired faculty. I'm Iranian, brown skin, brown hair. Um, now, I want to talk about my experience at Cal Poly and also inside the union. Uh, when it comes to activism around the issues on Palestine. On my campus, uh, I used to teach uh, comparative history of Latin America and the Middle East with focus on social justice issues and uh, liberation movements, revolutionary movements, basically. And I also used to organize panels, seminars, lectures for the community and for the university. And as such, I came under bad attacks by Zionist organizations. And the attacks got really intensified after 9-11 and especially the invasion of Iraq. And I think that's the time that Stevie was in my class. So I was doing an open class, uh, bringing speakers on Iraq, on imperialism, on uh, Palestine, all of that. And um, the Zionist groups began a concerted uh, letter writing campaign to the administration. So I came under attack uh, from the administration. They were very clearly, they were asking me to change my direction and slow down on my teachings on Palestine and focus on other issues, which of course I was not going to do. At that time, I was also an activist in the CFA. I was actually a chapter president at the time. So I decided to file um, a grievance for violation of my academic freedoms. 
And to my dismay, I found out that there was no article in our contract supporting uh, academic freedom. There is some mention in the introduction, but no enforceable article. Uh, so at that time, I knew that I could not file grievance. But as a union activist, I began focusing on union, um, organizing panels and discussions on Palestine. And the reaction of the union leadership was in the beginning lukewarm and it ended up being uh, kind of hostile. An example of it was a, a resolution that the Peace and Justice Committee of the CFA statewide uh, approved in 2009. That was a time that there was a war on Gaza. Uh, the Israeli army killed more than 1,400 Palestinians in a matter of a few weeks. They were using bombs, including white phosphorus bombs on residential areas, on schools, on refugee camps, on universities. So I took this resolution to the Peace and Justice Committee of the, CF, of the CFA condemning the war. We had long, long discussions and the resolution was amended over and over and by the end, it became a very watered down language. It was really, it was not saying anything, but it was still about Gaza. Uh, so the committee uh, approved the resolution. We sent it to the board of directors and they approved it. And the resolution was posted on our website. And the Zionist groups found out about the resolution and began their attack on the resolution and on me personally. And some of the attacks were really vicious articles and you know, all kinds of things on their website. Uh, at that time, I was uh, in the statewide leadership of the union. And as such, I was on the email list of the leadership. So I could follow up the discussions, the internal discussions of the board of directors about the resolution and about the attacks. And to my dismay, not only I was not supported or protected by the union, but some of my so-called progressive colleagues began attacking me personally. I was accused of having a personal agenda inside the union. I was accused of singling out uh, Israel and I was accused of being divisive in the unions. So at that time, I got the message. Uh, I responded to the board discussion by just explaining about the background of those organizations who were attacking, where the funding was coming, what was the platform and everything. And immediately I was dropped off that email list. So I could never follow up the, that discussion. I don't know where it went, but I noticed that the resolution was pulled down from the website. So I got the message loud and clear that the union supports uh, social justice issues for all but Palestinians. Uh, but the thing is that uh, at that point, I never left the union. I'm, I'm still a retired member of the union, but I left activism in the union because I knew that it was not my place. Uh, uh, but the union has changed. And the example of this change is the formation of PAM caucus and this panel. What hasn't changed is our contract. We still do not have an article in our contract about academic freedom. So legally, we do not have protection, union protection. If we do something, that some people out there don't like it. So I believe that uh, our focus should be on producing a better contract and, and at least one article on academic freedom. So the people who are encouraged to work for social justice would be protected by the union for their work.
I think I've gone over my time, so I apologize. And uh, one last thing, I'm so happy to be on this panel with Stevie. It's just, is like a teacher's dream to come to fruition that I have such a successful student and in such a right way. Thank you, Stevie. Thank you so much for your words, Manzar, for your, your comments. Our next panelist is Bida Samian. Hello. <laughs> um, it's so great to be speaking after Manzar because we kind of collaborated on some of those um, sessions that we had about Palestine in the um, first decade of 2000. I am a retired faculty at California State University, Fresno. And um, currently, I'm a, a research visiting researcher at UCLA. I'll talk about the endowed Edward Said professorship that uh, we tried to establish at Fresno State, and how the search was derailed by pro-Israel extremists when the list of four finalists, all of Arab American and Palestinian origin was announced. The Edward Said professorship was based on a half a million dollar endowment from the National Endowment for the Humanities and additional funding that we obtained. We got permission from Said's widow to use his name, which she graciously granted. And uh, we felt it was a perfect way to honor and memorialize him. There was a, uh, we established the search. There was a large number of highly qualified applicants, which eventually were narrowed down by the search committee to four finalists. I wasn't on the search committee, but I was director of the Middle East Studies program. So I was overseeing the search. When the names of the four finalists were announced, and faculty was invited to attend their lectures because they were coming to campus, the problem started. A number of pro-Israeli faculty and community members pressured search committee members against the candidates. Some either even writing letters to individual search committee members. Now this is completely procedurally illegal to do. We notified the dean and the provost, but there was no response. When the search committee forwarded, I'm going very summarily quickly over the story. When the search committee forwarded the ranked list of finalists to the dean, so these were ranked. After a few days, we were notified that the search had been canceled because of some procedural policy violation without mentioning what the violation was. So the finalists finally who had received a letter, a similar letter that the search had been canceled, started calling me and asking what was going on. To protest this unjustified move by the administration, <clears throat> I decided to resign from my job at the university. So I wrote a letter of resignation explaining the whole story. And I got some help from Pal Legal and made that letter public. I sent copies to the finalists, to all the people I knew and put it on the web. And somehow the letter was picked up on the web um, by people in London, in South Africa, so the result was a huge number of letters of protest to the administration from all over the world. Now, the letter is very long and explains the whole situation. Over 1,500 letters of objection were sent 
And there were also letters from uh, JVP, Armenian scholars, Israeli faculty for justice, USACBI, California scholars for academic freedom, and many others. The administration tried to change their story a number of times, and in, in a covert way, blame me. And of course, the Zionist groups were blaming me all along. But it was clear they were lying. Of course, I was attacked by um, Middle East Forum, Campus Watch, FresnoZionist.com, and a number of other groups and organizations in multiple ways. But the truth had come out, and the finalists felt there was some justice. I have to add that a couple of them got much better positions at Ivy League universities. And Joseph Castro, who was then president of CSU Fresno, and knew what he was doing with the search, did become chancellor, <laughs> as most of you know. And of course, not for long, happily, not for long. So, the question that I like to raise is, how is it possible at a public university for something like this to happen? And we know this is not the only time this has happened. We know examples of Stephen Salida, Norman Finkelstein, many others. How is it possible for administrators to break policy and lie and yet get away with it and get promoted to higher position. So the dean at the time of the College of Arts and Humanities who was overseeing this search, who was one of our faculty members when I was dean, he is now the president of Cal State Fresno. And of course, Castro became chancellor. So I wanna leave this question with you to think about. But to me, because I've been at, in the system for close to 40 years, when I started teaching in 1983, the percentage of tenured and tenure track faculty to lecturers at Fresno State was 95%. 95% tenure, tenure track, 5% lecturers. I was hired as a lecturer, but I was given, I was a full lecturer. And I was, my teaching load was four courses, not five. Today, the ratio at least at Fresno is over 50% lecturer, close to 60% lecturer. And lecturers have no job security. They have to live paycheck to paycheck. So the whole system of faculty has changed in terms of job security, the percentage of tenure track faculty that we have who can fight and stand for what is right. Now, at the same time, the second issue is when you look at administration. 40 years ago in 1983, when I started at Fresno State, administration was much smaller. The layers of administration was much smaller. And many of them came from faculty and went back to faculty when they wanted to retire. I myself, I was dean for 20 years and I went back to faculty um, because we all saw that faculty was the core of the university. Faculty was, you know, the most important aspect of the university of curriculum of teaching. Today, these layers of administration have increased tremendously and they're there to get a higher job. They're there for a few years to move on to a better position. And if you look at your administrators on your campuses, you will see this. 
So I will stop here because I think I've used up my, oh, and the pay scales for administrators has increased tremendously. I mean, while the part-time faculty get $5,000 per course, and they have to teach five courses to make a living, uh, Joseph Castro asked for $640,000 as chancellor, and he was given that. And today he's, he's being given a million dollars so that he can step down. So this is totally unjust, unfair, and needs to be changed. We need an administration that comes from faculty and goes back to faculty. We need faculty at the core of the institution. Thank you so much. That's a great, a great place to stop. Um, so appreciate the, the longevity of your experiences and your fight and the perspective that you bring to this panel. Um, our, our next panelist is Rachel Stryker from Cal State University East Bay. Well, Vita, you have just set me up perfectly. It's almost like we planned it in terms of what I'm about to talk about. Thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Rachel Stryker. I'm um, a chapter president at um, Cal State East Bay. I'm also an associate professor in human development on that campus. Um, what I want to talk about today is, as somebody who is part of those two years and co-founding our caucus, is um, opportunities for cross-caucus work to address a lot of the issues that we're talking about here. And I would say that unfortunately, Castro has set us up perfectly for some of that as well, um, <laughs> uh, worse than Vita has. But I would say that with Castro's resignation, rightly, he has really shown a light on an ongoing and systemic problem of it's almost like a cornerstone in the CSU of how um, Palestine Arab and Muslim colleagues are discriminated against. Uh, and we maintain um, certain forms of racial, ethnic, gender and gender identity discrimination. And that is the mishandling of Title IX in our campus. Um, I hope none of you have had to grieve uh, and file a Title IX complaint for any reason, but I know many of you have. And I would be very shocked if any of you said that was a good experience or a useful experience or a, a non-re-traumatizing experience. Um, the focus right now with Chancellor is on the aspects of sort of Title IX as an attempt in 1972 to create gender equity uh, in many areas of public universities and all universities and colleges in the US. Um, when it started, it was usually housed. The Title IX office is a university office, but was housed in like student centers or student affairs centers. However, increasingly, the Title IX office and its investigators who are university employees are housed under risk management which should give you an understanding of the historical uh, changes, the trends and thinking about it. What this generally means is that um, investigators are considered university employees and any Title IX um, grievance that is filed, you know, the chancellor has shed light on sexual discrimination, sexual mistreatment, sexual abuse, um, but it also, you can file a Title IX grievance for racial or ethnic discrimination as well. And those folks are university employees and that is a university office. And so what many of you probably found out is that they rule in favor of the university 95% of the time, no matter how much evidence you actually can present. This is a problem. This is a serious problem for so many of you know, the communities and CSU faculty, students, and staff um, who are marginalized by the CSU. 
so we've got that problem that they are university employees and they rule in favor of the university most time. Second issue is that as it stands right now and kind of have tied folks' hands, unions' hands in CSU, is that anytime you say you want to file a discrimination or a harassment or an abuse charge against the university, you have to go through the Title IX process first before CFA can actually grieve for you and arbitrate it. This is so mishandled in terms of time and investigation and confidentiality, so many issues that the person who grieves usually remains in the dangerous situation for months and months and months. Um, we need to change that across the caucuses, the cross caucus collective work, I think. And the last thing is that, um, of course, folks who are BIPOC, LGBTQIA+, disabled, have different gender expression identity are disproportionately negatively affected by this system that is problematic. These are often the folks who are making these charges. So what I um, am excited about in PAM and other caucuses, is specifically for PAM to do this cross caucus work with others, is to really work on a platform that is much more um, survivor centered in terms to create alternatives to this Title IX process and see how far we can get um, in terms of contract changing our contracts so our hands are not so tied on this. My, my, I'm talking to so many people, they think this is a Castro issue. It's not a Castro issue. It's not even a CSU issue. These are, this is a problem across many United States universities and colleges. But I think like we lead on so many other things, I do think CSA can lead on this as well. And so I wanted to ask if Kiki would please put a link to a, a petition that is a first step to a larger platform to address this Title IX issue. Whether it means reforming it, abolishing it, replacing it, this Title IX, the way, I won't say Title IX itself is problematic, but the way the university and the, the administration have co-opted it is a problem. And it is a cornerstone of structural violence in our university system that we work for. So um, yeah, one of the ways that we're starting um, is we're kind of, taking advantage, I think, of what has happened with Chancellor Castro, going to the Board of Trustees in two weeks and presenting a petition. It's a CSU-wide petition for an independent legislative investigation into how CSU handles Title IX. Um, because currently, in the wake of Castro, what the Board of Trustees wants to do is investigate itself. You know, we all know how that often turns out. So this petition is to First, again, not the only thing to get the, um, the investigation to be put into the hands of the legislature so that it can be, uh, there will be less con conflicts of interest. And I hope um, that anyone interested will join Pam um, and we can all see um, how we can creatively and expansively work on what I think is an issue to help fight Islamophobia, um, anti-Palestine, anti-Muslim, and anti-Arab sentiment that we are talking about today in our um, panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, Rabab Abdulhadi is going to say a few words and then we are going to take questions and answers from the attendees. Hi everybody again, Rabab Abdulhadi. I have short hair, glasses, I'm Palestinian. I am wearing a Palestinian top. And actually, the scarf is the colors of the indigenous people in uh, uh, Sydney, which I've got that. And I was there, and the scarf is from Gaza. I want to actually just, as a discussion, just mention a few things as by the tradition of call and response of what people have said. I'm not going to do justice to everybody, but I'm just going to mention a few things. One is that to begin uh, by saying I come from uh, the Ahmed Studies Program and which everybody, the whole world recognizes except San Francisco State. San Francisco State does not recognize that. 
we had a very strong hearing, faculty hearing, two weeks ago, and today the university president vetoed. Again, this is the second veto that we have within a few months. And I, so I agree with what everybody that is saying. So I'm just going to go briefly over what people said and just maybe say one word or a couple of words response. One is the title of this conference and the whole question of from here to there, which basically means that we're actually supposed to be addressing the whole world. We're not supposed to be quote unquote addressing domestic issues and giving up of what is supposed to be in foreign issues as if the world and the United States are not connected with each other. They're very much connected, if not only through the budget that the United States gives of military aid to Israel to brutalize and kill Palestinians and conduct wars in our home countries, but it's also about the whole question of justice. It's also, I was also very interested in the title of the bridge that was signed, a quote from Angela Davis. And when I saw walls, I freaked out because of the upper side wall. But I thought that the way she was talking about it, it also brought up the questions of this bridge called my back or this bridge called, we call home. What is it? How do we think about the bridge and what bridges mean? So this is overall kind of like the, 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 the framework that I'm thinking about. Because I'm thinking about the questions that you all raised, but the whole question of the complicity of the academy and the structure of the academy. That the academy at the end of the day is an institution that encourages individual advancement, careerism, and you have to actually step on the shoulder of, not on the shoulder, on the back of others in order for you to achieve. This is what we're taught. And this is why the union and collective bargaining become a very important space for doing so. And this is why exactly the university is employing things like Title IX, which comes of the chancellor's office in a secretive manner in order for them to tie us up. I've been actually in a grievance since 2017 that has just now is going to arbitration. And it was a title supposed to be Title IX about discrimination and harassment by Islamophobic and Zionist groups like, such as the Canary Mission and the David Horowitz uh, Freedom Center who placed posters on our campus. And our campus thought that they have the right to do that because this is weaponizing free speech for them, for the right wing. So this is a question. What do we do about it? What do we do about the, the, the academics who are actually complicit? The people that you spoke about, Sabrina and Yazan, the people everybody spoke about, the people that you spoke about, Teresa, the people who are actually participating in using this in order to advance. There are, I, um, somebody, I think it was maybe Rana or somebody else mentioned the DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's very, very interesting that it's people like us who are actually recruited by the institution. I mean, speaks to Audrey Lord and uh, Bell Hooks and Franz Fanon and Malcolm X about the internalized colonialism, how people from our own communities are recruited, which is very interesting to be used as a baton. So actually we do not see who is really behind the big powers of white supremacy, uh, corporatization, the Zionists and so on who are coming together to make this happen. And they are, uh, they are basically masquerading about all of this stuff. And I will just mention the, the academics who have justified torture, the academic who's defending the Zionist uh, racist woman at San Jose State University who wants to actually sit on indigenous bones. They are uh, the academics who actually sought and saw the torture, the psychologists who saw the torture in, uh, in, in Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay and so on and so forth. So I think this is some of the issues that are actually very big that face all of us. The second question, I mean, I guess a bigger question, who speaks for whom? Do people speak for themselves? And one, do people face, which is what Trena was, was, was raising, but also who, actually gets to teach. The whole notion of the 1968 strike was about the spirit of, of 68, as we call it, was decolonizing the curriculum, opening up the universe to the community, and actually enabling people from the communities to teach the genders of members of the community to be able to learn about themselves from the perspectives of indigenous knowledges of these communities. The people who were participating were Somebody like Richard Oaks, who took over Alcatraz, the Black Panther Party, Black Student Union, 
the people who were in the Asian uh, Studies Department, the people who were actually opposing Vietnam. I mean, it was a very, very strong thing. We're seeing something very, very different today. So what does this really mean? And who is actually producing knowledge? And who's actually doing this for all of us? And who speaks for whom? And is it, and again, can you flip a coin and say, one Palestinian replaces another Palestinian? One black person replaces another black person? What is the content? versus, and this is the importance of the, of the caucus, that Palestine Arab Muslim caucus. It's not Palestinian. We spend a lot of time having discussions within the union saying it is not Palestinian. It is Palestine because we're talking about the project of justice. And, and this is one of the issues that keep uh, coming up again and again. I also want to talk about the ways in which the right wing and, and the Zionists collaborate with each other. So every single time there has been an attack on the ethnic studies model curriculum, it wasn't only Amcha, it wasn't only Stand With Us, it wasn't only the Anti-Defamation League, it wasn't also the Zionist Organization of America or Campus World. Campus Reform, Fox and Friends, the people from the Trump camp and all of them, they all were very much participating and colluding with that. And this is a very big uh, um, uh, agenda of white supremacists. Of, and then the other aspect of it is the corporatization of the university, which I think a few spoke about that in the ways in which the university has outsourced even our travel, even our travel, even student affairs, even something called instructional related activities. All of it is all placed in something in a UFM space that none of it has academics on it. None of it has scholars on it. So you are not actually being evaluated by your peers. You're being evaluated by, by a bureaucrat who has been hired for a corporate position who checks the boxes. And if you don't check the boxes and we don't know how to fill out certain forms that are already produced in order to produce a particular result, exactly the same way that the funding for people who were affected by COVID also took place. The big banks took it. I mean, I think it's really, really important for, our, for us to be connecting with all these issues together. For example, I'm just talking about, you talk, you talk about Manzar's course, about the comparative. When we try, we try to offer comparative border studies, Palestine and Mexico, Campus Reform submitted three requests for public records from the university. As a result, our colleagues put blocks into preventing the course from going forward. And so this is the question is kind of like, how do we assign responsibility? The last point I wanted to talk about, aside from the whole question of complicity, is how this is also not just about Islamophobia. I think it's really, really important for all also to bring in Orientalism. I think it's very, very important for us to bring colonial feminism. I think it's very, very important for us to bring in pinkwashing and the ways in which gender and sexual justice are also being used and deployed in order to reproduce the same issues that we've been fighting against again and again and again to get where we're at. So I want to end with something really positive in the sense that we are coming together. This is really important. We are struggling with each other. We are in this space with each other. But I think it's really, really important for us to discuss the structures of, ab about, without, and the structures within, and figure out how do we also connect, which all of us do, with our communities in order for us to really struggle and achieve it, and think about how do we have the backs of those of us against whom a huge cost is being uh, uh, presented. So there is new McCarthyism that's going on, but how do we actually come together? in order for us to, to make sure that people who are taking the stance and so on are protected, have their backs, being able to feel that there is a community that loves us, supports us, and protect us. So we dare to speak up, we dare to challenge, we dare to fight, and we are not going at the end of it to be destroyed in terms of our careers, in terms of our lives, in terms of our securities, in terms of our health, in terms of everything else. And I think we are on the, right, uh, on, 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 on the right side, we're moving forward. The fact that we have this, we had the panel before, we have the struggle that's going on is really, really amazing, but we have a lot of tasks ahead of us. And I will stop at that. Thank you so much, Rabab. And we do have a, a wonderful question, well, a painful question that some of our speakers are, are writing responses to, but I, um, we have, very little time, and I'm wondering if anyone wants to say something um, about this question um, from Caroline Lane. I'm a visibly Muslim woman, black and white, often assumed to be Arab. 
as a hijabi lecturer, how can I navigate the ever-present anti-Muslim, anti-Arab, anti-Black racism on my campus? I feel used for optics with little career opportunity. Um, and there's three parts to this excellent question. So uh, we, we have maybe a minute uh, before our closing, if anyone wants to you know, address the questions posed. I wrote my response in the, in the chat. Um, I wish I had the answer to the first question. I think that's part of the struggle that we're, um, we engage in every day. But I think probably the most important thing is to um, find a community of, of, um, of, of folks who are um, aligned to your, um, to, to your views and, and recognize that the work that you're doing on Muslim students in public schools is so incredibly important. And I know that it, at times it's going to be um, tough to do, but it is, you need to do it. And um, I just ask that you find a community um, of supporters to work with you on it because it will be tough. Thank you, Teresa. Um, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say, I think building on that, if you're looking for a community of support, um, like I'd mentioned in the question, um, there or the answer, there is this coalition that I thought we'd have time, but there's so many things to talk about, um, called the Partnership to End Gendered Islamophobia. And it more intentionally is looking at the intersections of gender and the war on terror. But there's a group of us, Sabrina is a really active facilitator in the space and has done a lot of really critical academic work. But it's also become a space where folks who are faculty or folks who are active students have also been able to discuss and relate um, over their experiences with Islamophobia, either within the workspace, hiring opportunities, the lack thereof, employment harassment and stuff like that. Um, I'd included my email and my verbal response, um, but I'm also gonna, um, that's a, a PDF of the report from um, a conference that we'd held, now it's like two years ago, but within it, there's also like a chart um, that looks at some of the different ways that Islamophobia manifests on the academic front um, for people who identify as women and or queer. Um, but yeah, if you ever wanted to connect, we'd be happy to have you in that space and everyone here, obviously. But yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we just want to encourage folks to attend the Jeopardy that's after this and the rest of the, the conference tomorrow. I wanted to thank all of our panelists and the discussant and the uh, CFA staff, um, all the organizers and um, people doing logistics and the attendees and speakers of this conference. Um, Thank you so much.